welcome to Growing Up in Easton. Uh, my name is Priscilla Almquist Olson, your host, and it gives me a great deal of pleasure today to welcome uh, Charlotte Hines Manick. And I didn't know Charlotte, but I knew her older sister, Eleanor, uh, who was a year behind me, and we sang in the chorus. But let's get a little background information on Charlotte. Charlotte, tell us where you were born and uh, how you came to relate, how you came to Easton. Well, I was born in Boston, but my father worked in the foundry down here, so he bought a house and land, and we were back and forth here through, let's see, um, he traveled on the train back and forth to Everett, which is where we lived, and then when he bought the house, we, were down, we moved down, and I must have been three or four, because I remember being home a year when my sisters went to school. Mm. Oh, okay. so you were a spoiled child. <laughs> no, 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 of course not. No. I was the youngest yeah. girl, but I was not yeah. a spoiled child. And then I went to kindergarten. I was the only one of my sisters and I that went to kindergarten. And I would, we lived at the Five Corners area, and I would walk from our house the quarter mile to the corner wait for my ride, who was someone that my father worked with, and go, went home for lunch. And he would take me up to the Northeastern Grammar School. You went all there? Oh, OK. So you didn't go to Unionville? No, Unionville was clear across town. Oh, was it? OK. Clear across I don't mean town. Unionville. We, I mean Furnace Village. No, no. Up the, but kindergarten I went to. Mm -hmm. I got that ride up to mm -hmm. Northeastern. <clears throat> And then first grade, I started at Furnace Village. Okay. Did you what have... what is now the water department. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did you have Miss Leach as a kindergarten teacher? Yes. Yes. So yes. did I. Yes. Did you play yes. with clay and make figures or we try to at five years old? Clay. We did pegboards. Um, I'm trying to think what else I remember. I remember bringing one of my two-sided dolls to school. Mm -hmm. And you know, you just flipped the dress and you had one kind of doll and you flipped it the other way and you had a different kind of doll. Mm -hmm. And remember sticking it in, uh, it was around Halloween, sticking it in one of those paper mache pumpkins oh. so she could stand up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And then having yeah. to remember to take her out of the pumpkin mm. so I could, and leave the pumpkin so I could take her home. Yeah. So, um, how, do you remember Miss Leach and, and what, what kind of a individual she was? Do you have any f memories about kindergarten? Not really, except that I knew walking up from Main Street to the door on the left at the bottom basement. Uh -huh. It was a very long walk and a very long <laughs> hill, is what I remember. It was, it's a steep hill going through the street. It's a very street. steep hill for yeah. a four, four year old to go yeah. Up, yeah. up there. Well, I remember Miss Leach. She was very warm and motherly, but she was a single woman. She was never married. Um, we would call her a, an old maid or a spinster in, that, in those days, but she was so motherly and nurturing as I remember her, and she taught for probably 50 years. She yeah, I know she taught for a long, long, long time. time. <laughs> because she was pretty old when I had her. Yeah, but anyway. So, so you went to uh, Furnace Village School, which was in your right. neighborhood, of course, right. second grade, and um, did, did you, you, you must have made some friends. Oh, we lived next door to the Smith brothers. Mm -hmm. And they were next door to the Williams. Mm -hmm. um, oh, that would be Avery Williams. Avery Williams. Yes. Yes. Okay. He's been on this show. And everybody in town knows Avery Lee Williams. <laughs> we knew Avery. He was one of the older brothers. So, uh -huh. And his sister, Claire. So I went to school with, let's see, Claire went, was in classes with my sister. And Dottie was a year ahead of me, mm -hmm. Dottie Williams. And the Smith twins. 
Oh, those were two my sister could never tell apart. But I could always tell those two apart. Mm -hmm. You know, they were twins, mm -hmm. but they weren't really identical. I see. Yeah. Oh, that was the neighborhood right. group. And let me think who else was there. Um, as I have to remember by name, because I started school here. I went through first grade here. We moved to Everett so that during the winter, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, and seventh grade were in Everett, but we were here in Easton every summer. Mm -hmm. Back to the... Yeah, and, and what made you go to Everett? Did you have another house there? No. Um, <clears throat> you remember I was very young. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it's called... We went to school in Everett. I do remember we moved into my grandfather's house. Uh, my grandmother died about that time. Oh. So that's that was a what I remember about when you were. Jesus. So when you were in um, in Easton during the summer, uh, you you must have done quite a few uh, activities with some of your neighbor friends and. We hiked through the woods. Mm -hmm. We climbed trees. We battled between the boys and the girls in the neighborhood. Did you ever have contests? Always. Always <laughs> kind, always a kind of contest. Yeah. Um, tree climbing was one of the favorites. Races were, were the other. But it also, we were right on 106, and at that point in time, 106 was the way you went from the Mansfield side of town, or the mm -hmm. side of town, to the Cape. So on Friday night, all the traffic went by our house on the way to the Cape. And on Sunday night, all the traffic came back the other way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there was no Route 24, right. there was no 495, there was mm -hmm. nothing. That was mm -hmm. the road between 106 mm -hmm. and 123. We, and I remember going to the Cape um, on 106 too. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but I lived in Northeastern, so we would go down 138 and take a left onto 106, go through West Bridgewater and East Bridgewater oh, yeah. and so forth. And uh, I remember there was a, a, a very famous chicken restaurant. Did you ever remember that on the way to the Cape? I don't remember the chicken restaurant, but I remember Michelson's Cow Farms down at the corner of oh. 106 and 138. Michelson's Cow Farm, right. That was That has been... Uh, it, uh, mentioned and photographs have been presented in the Facebook page Eastern Stories. Okay. Yeah, and uh, that Amy, Amy McManus started, and uh, it's just uh, wonderful. Now, I don't have a recollection of that farm, but um, so many people do. Well, the farm was there, and it covered both sides of the 106. And where the condos, there, the gas station, that was all part of it. Mm -hmm. um, and whatever office building is on the very corner, mm -hmm. that was all part of Michelson's farm. My goodness, big farm. Huge farm. Well, this big chicken farm. restaurant was very famous because uh, I think you, you'd get a whole, you get a half a chicken and um, mashed potatoes, a cranberry sauce, stuffing, a vegetable, usually green beans, and all of that for. I think two dollars and twenty-five cents, something like that. And my parents would, when they came back from the Cape, they would always stop there, and uh, it was very popular. Lots of people, and uh, lots of chickens. But lots I think of they chickens. were. I think it was a chicken farm. Probably. Yeah. Probably yeah. there yeah. was also um, on the Five Corners side, going towards Norton. And I think with a large curve is there was a turkey farm. Mm -hmm. The coops are still there, mm -hmm. and it's now a nursery. Uh -huh. and a big curve on mm -hmm. 123 going yeah. towards Norton. Well, Easton has changed considerably because um, I remember when I was 16, um, and that was in uh, 1958, and my cousin Carolyn, she taught me how to drive. Because you know we got our license at sixteen, and she had a nineteen thirty eight coupe mm -hmm. with a with a stick that came up from the floor. Do you remember those? Oh yes, yes. Yeah. And so we went to Bay Road 
because there were only three houses on Bay Road. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and lots of farms. And our milkman, Mr. Gooch, had one of those farms. And he would uh, knock on the back door and, and, and bring the milk right into the kitchen. And, and he and my mother loved to chat. And uh, so I have those fun memories. And I remember him with these big denim overalls. And he smelled like cow dung. <laughs> well, it's hard to be a milk farmer without smelling like the cows right. that you yeah. there. Mm -hmm. um, but I remember growing up and folks talking about, um, you know, we came back in the eighth grade. So I graduated from here. We were, let's see, Eleanor's class was the first class into the new high school. Yes, it, 1959. In 59, right. it, was, mm -hmm. it was the one level, single mm -hmm. square thing. Um, and each class subsequent to that was larger than the one before, and the kids were taller than I was. But I remember our class was a little rambunctious. And 1962? Yes. <laughs> okay, um, Sharon Baird. Okay. Sharon Baird was a classmate, yes. Yes. And um, Butch Holmes. And, and my cousin, Rosemary Santos. And Rosemary. Um, and Butch Holmes, right? And Joan Burke. Oh, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And Susan Haley. And my class was one of those that figured out that if you go up across the roof, you could put all sorts of things into the atrium, all sorts of creatures. So in the morning, teachers arriving never knew what was going to be in the atrium, <laughs> um, including the one day that there was a skunk in there. I don't know who took responsibility for that, <laughs> but they got the police up or the animal control up to take care of the skunk, and they were going to shoot it under Mr. Burke's window. It's called no. You can't shoot skunk in the middle of right. So they had another way of, of getting rid of that. I also remember the discussion about could they get a cow into the atrium? <laughs> well, getting the cow up to the roof would not have been a problem mm. because you can lead a cow upstairs. But you can't lead a cow downstairs, so you have to have a ramp. So since we never figured out how to have get a ramp over there. We never got the cow into, mm. the, into the atrium. I never heard those stories. Now that was, <laughs> I, I was the class of 1960. Um, I was one year behind your older sister, Eleanor. Yes. And um, uh, we became friends because she, we were in chorus together. And um, so I never knew your uh, Pat, who was 61, or you, yes. Charlotte, 62. 62. Um, I, I know you because we, Played basketball. Oh yes, Pat played basketball, and I mean, I played field hockey for four years. So did I. And some yeah. reason or other, I decided I was going to play basketball. Mm -hmm. Well, at that point, I was about that big around and not any taller than I am now. Mm -hmm. And I remember you because I remember spending a lot of time on the floor because I was a guard and you were forward, mm -hmm. and I used to get body blocked. Which is why not so strange. Which which is why I remember basketball and wondering why on earth I ever decided I wanted to play it. <laughs> and in those days we only put girls basketball only played half court. Yeah, which was awful. And that was never the way it was. My mother is in the uh, Enos uh, Larson Almquist. She's in the Alvarez Hall of Fame. Uh, and her she she ran track. Um, uh, she played field hockey, but her, her, the, the most predominant sport was basketball. Mm -hmm. And th they had their games on Friday nights. This is in the 20s. Oh, goodness. Yeah. She graduated in 1929. So this was in the 20s, and women's sports, especially basketball, were huge. And uh, they had a huge following. And they played full court press, just like they played the men's rules, and uh, the same. And now, thank goodness, that's back. But we were discriminated against. We were held back that we couldn't, you know, play n normally. And it had something to do, I think, with um, the 1950s, putting women on a pedestal and, you know, talking about um, describing women as, as weak and fragile and, and all, of, and yes, all yes. of that. And so that's, I think that had its, 
had its root in that attitude. And, um, and, and it's so strange to me because during the World War II, just before, you know, in the 40s, women took over all the men's jobs here. You know, Rosie the Riveter, um, you know. We knew really we could do anything. There were no men around. Do. Yeah, then, and the women had to do everything. So to be um, put down like that is just yeah. amazing. But I remember that. We even flew the planes across the ocean yep. so that our, f our fighters could fly them. Mm -hmm. They didn't come back and get them. We, we, as women, delivered them. But I remember the year that I graduated in 65, we were really um, feeling like we ruled the cock that ruled the roost mm -hmm. because we had done all sorts of Hakamak League champions. Mm -hmm. we no, had you graduated girls, 62. 62, yes, I yeah. said 65, 62. We had the girls hockey championship. We had the girls and the boys basketball championship. We had the football championship. So when we walked across town, we figured no one could touch us. <laughs> we were in the class of, yeah. of 62. Mm. Um, since then, it's been ups and downs and sideways, but we, we took over the Hockamock yeah. League, and folks would sort of yeah. well, I look at us sideways uh, when we did that. Yeah, in 1958, uh, I remember that year because we were, our boys' basketball team was playing in the gardens uh, in the tech tourney. Mm -hmm. And my brother, my kid brother, uh, Fred Almquist, Freddie, he, he was, in 1967, played uh, in, the, in the Boston Gardens also. So... Um, yeah, it's it. We we were champion football teams and basketball, but okay. that's because we had Muzzy Val Moscato. Yes, yes. And and um, D Dick Nixon. And Bill Nixon. Bill Nixon. Yeah, yeah Dick. Uh oh. <laughs> Bill. Bill Nixon. Yeah. Yeah, and um, so uh, athletics was was a big dr uh, right. big draw, and and the community, not just the students, but the community really supported. And you had to get to a basketball game pretty early to get a seat. Yes. Uh, yes. You know, so, um, and it was just wonderful, the camaraderie. Um, and uh, I think it really brought, the athletics here in Easton brought the community together. But remember, how many pe pe people lived in Easton at that time? Um, close to 10,000. No, you're wrong. In 1960, there were 6,100. 6,100. 6,100. I think so. Yep, something like that. And when my mother was growing up, it was um, five, less than 5,000 well, people. Well, more than that. But anyway, uh, okay. so you, you then um, graduated and you went to nursing school, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about that and what you're doing presently. Well, I had several classmates who also ended up going into nursing. But presently, um, when well, I finished at Beth Israel Hospital School of Nursing, I went on to Boston University, mm -hmm. uh, where I got acquired a baccalaureate and a master's. Mm -hmm. um, I taught, excuse me, I practiced nursing at Beth Israel in Boston mm -hmm. um, at Children's Floating Hospital mm -hmm. out of Tufts. I did home health care, I private duty care. I moved to South Carolina. I don't know why, but I moved. <laughs> I think it's because one of the gals that I worked with, uh, we had both started our nursing careers at Beth Israel. And when she got married, she, her husband was in the Marine Corps, and they went from here to there. And she ended up in South Carolina, and I went down on a visit, which was the game plan. My game plan was not to stay and teach for 20 years. Oh, my goodness. Wow. I had said three at the most, but I have no idea why I was in South Carolina in the... Let's see, when would that have been? That would have been 83, 82, mm -hmm. in the early 80s. Mm -hmm. Just past folks with desegregation, they were still having growing pains. Mm. And what got me thinking, I was in one of those towns, it was a 
college community, but unlike college communities in the Northeast, uh, this college had been a Methodist mm -hmm. college, and then it became a state college. But I was in the town next to, well, let's see, you go into a road map and you see in red letters the highlight that says Bedford Falls, you know, 100 foot falls. This one is such and such a granite rock. Well, the town next to where I was living, their little red note was birthplace and death better the Confederacy. <laughs> How inappropriate. Does that tell you something about where I was? That was yeah. I ended up be getting more hassle mm -hmm. at being a Yankee than I did anything else. Really? I was from north of the Mason-Dixon line. Mm -hmm. And the first time I went down to visit, um, did a tour of hospitals and the, the school. This was before I went to work there. And one of the aides asked me, well, I can't stand it any longer. And this would have been somebody I may never have seen again mm -hmm. if I hadn't gone down. She said, you're a Yankee. I said, yeah. And what kind? And do you know the difference? Well, there's the Yankee who comes down and visits and goes home. And then there's the Yankee who comes down and tries to change things. Uh -huh. <laughs> so that was first meeting, first encounter. Wow. Strange question, I thought, but... Mm. And you can understand the answers. Yeah, especially the second one. Mm. I ended up being one of those folks who came down and wanted to change things because I was teaching in the nursing program and I was changing mm -hmm. the education for some people. Wonderful. Now, um, our listeners at home should, should know that your family was the first black family in Easton. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we had uh, uh, Ruth Ashley, who was African American also, um, teaching music. She didn't come until much later. Uh, oh no, I had her. I had her. No, but she missed all of those years up until we were in high school mm -hmm. before Ruth came. Mm -hmm. Well, I remember being, she, was, she directed our course, and, yeah. and that was in 58, 59, and so you can speak to Eleanor, she'll remember that. But anyway, um, tell me about your experiences. Uh, I mean, here you are in a community that's all white, and uh, do you remember anything? Tell me the positives first. I either as the youngest, think positive about everybody. Mm -hmm. And remember, I had two older sisters who did a lot of battle and weighed a lot of groundwork before I did. Mm -hmm. We also had very protective individuals in the neighborhood. And I can remember one day riding on the late bus home from school after some activity. and. Dottie Williams told the bus driver that one of the kids was picking on me. Mm -hmm. And the bus driver stopped and put him off the bus. <laughs> that's what it's called. Wow. And that's the kind of community that Easton was and that we grew up in. Yeah. That everybody knew who everybody, and everybody every was. And, and, and there was respect. There was respect for, mm -hmm. for everyone. Yeah. I can remember Oh, when I, when I was young and there were, there might have been an accident or there may have been uh, folks passing through town who had car problem. Mm -hmm. And the police would get the car to Chawi Barboza's garage, which was there at Five Corners. Mm -hmm. And the people would end up coming to, being brought to our house to wait while their car was being fixed. No, really? Yeah. Isn't that amazing? And that's, that is, that's how it worked. Yeah. You know? Well, I remember walking um, with my mother down Main Street, and um, she would stop. There was a, a child and, and his mother, 
and he was intellectually challenged. Yes. And um, he was not institutionalized. He was raised at the home. And uh, he went uh, to school and so forth. And my mother made a special uh, effort. And she wanted uh, me to know that uh, every, nobody is better than anyone else. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you know that lesson really st stuck with me. And, and I can remember many other incidents where, where people, uh, and they weren't afraid to, to show their intellectually challenged or handicapped child or uh, mentally disturbed even children, uh, because we all were uh, sort of like a, a village, a big family. Was a big family. And we, we, we thought we had every right to uh, insert our own personalities into whatever was happening. So if... Um, we were not bystanders. Yeah, right. You yeah. know, if there was something that was wrong, someone stepped in exactly. to help fix it. Exactly. We went by okay. By the way, Dottie Williams was a classmate <clears throat> of my, my sister. Was she in your class? No, she was she a was, year ahead of yeah, her. Yeah, and so she, she was in my... With Pat's late, class. Yes, yeah, she was in 61. Class. And my late sister, Karen, was in that class. And, and Dottie and she were good friends. And Dottie has passed away, I think it's been almost two years now. And At she, least that, yeah. And she and Karen both went into nursing. Yes. And I think it had a lot to do with friendship. That um, if your if your friend went into you sort of followed, everybody you know found their way. But that was a strong influence. I, th I think. I had other classmates that went into nursing that surprised me because we we hadn't talked about mm -hmm. them going oh. into nursing. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Madeline Marshall was one who went into nursing. Who? Madeline Marshall. Oh, yes. Okay, she ended up in nursing. And Kathy, oh. What was Madeline's maiden name? Marshall. Oh, it was Marshall, right. Yeah. And I'm trying to think, Kathy. Kathy lived in southeastern on 123. I'm trying to think of what her last name. But she went into nursing. And some of these folks went into nursing. Oh. After we had established a nursing club, so those that had nursing interest. I see. Oh, interesting. We, I didn't we, know that. At no, the school. At the school, yeah. we, we did that. Yeah, at Oliver Ames. Right. Great. So, because one of our guidance counselors <clears throat> was a nurse, and mm -hmm. we just got her involved mm -hmm. in it. And I was thinking back. You talked about Mrs. Ashley. Uh, she'd come by the house often for tea or coffee. But she really? became great friends of ours, and my mother's particularly. And we'd talk about what was going on in town. Mm -hmm. And she would talk about this family that had moved in, or which school had more mm -hmm. people of color that had come to town, because we said, OK, there's more. Where are they? <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, but she, uh, she was wonderful. Fantastic. Oh, she was. Woman. And she was. And she was tiny, and, and, but she was. She had the biggest heart and the and the biggest voice too. And a I, tennis fan. She and her husband. Oh, really? Big tennis. Oh, I didn't know fans. that. But she was very commanding, you know. And if, when she was leading the chorus, I mean, we were all just really ga gazed right at her. We didn't dare look at any other place. You and, missed information, right? <laughs> <laughs> and she, we loved her. We loved her. Do you remember Dolores Smith? Mm-mm. Because this also was the time when we were talking about sending people into space in the President's Physical Fitness Council. So we went from having gym two days a week to having some sort of gym five days a week. And Dolores Smith was one of the gym teachers that came. And she also was a teacher of color. Really? Yes. OK, so that she must have come after my time. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Not too long after, mm. though. It, it's an interesting period um, because um, diversity was not a hallmark of Easton. Um, I interviewed a classmate of mine, Ivan Rosenberg, and his father was Dr. Rosenberg, the dentist, right on Center Street. Mm -hmm. And um, he, he was, they were the only Jewish family in town, if you can believe that. And he and I were voted most studious by our <laughs> classmates. So in the yearbook, there we are doing something. I'm, I'm, a, I'm on the floor reading a book, and I don't know what he was doing. 
But he's become very successful. Uh, he has his doctorate and a couple things. And um, I went on to law school, became a lawyer. So we had... I didn't know that about you. Well, you didn't? No. Oh, I was a school teacher first for 10 years, and then I went to law school. I went to Northeastern Law. But anyway, I think we, we had the feeling that we could do anything, and part of that was because we were so independent. We were told we could do anything. That's right. What, whatever you want to do, right. do it. Yeah. So th in my class especially, there are lots of people who have accomplished great things, and in other classes too. Um, some have run, uh, run for Congress, and uh, not in my class, but in other classes, and um, it, it's just uh, amazing. Well, but, you know, today children are really sheltered, and that expression, helicopter parents, is just oh, amazing. And it was go outside and play and come home before the street lights come on. Or when the street lights or come on. Or when they come on. It, That's the first one home. comes on, and everybody knew the rule, and everybody went home. Right. Right. And nobody, and people got more scrapes and bumps and bruises on the, some of the uh, equipment at, at the Frothingham Park. And oh, yes. When you came home with those cuts and, and so forth, you know, you didn't come home whimpering. You came home and, and your mother put the iodine on and you screamed and a Band-Aid, and that was it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the mother and the father... You didn't go to somebody else's house to get it fixed either. You had to go home. Right, you had to go home. Yeah. But um, parents didn't, you know, they thought that's part of life. You know, they didn't get overly protective at all. In fact, I think um, we were victims of benign neglect. I was don't you talking think? with my granddaughter the other day, and I don't know how we got around to what we were talking about, tree climbing. Mm -hmm. She is 10, and she says, she's never climbed a tree. Well, she climbed a tree when she was much younger. Uh -huh. But I look at the trees now, there's no way you can climb a tree. We've cut off all the lower bridges. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. We've coddled the kids, so if they fall down and go boom, it, we hover, mm -hmm. and it's a major kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, we're at a point where you can't talk to somebody else's child in terms of stop doing what you're doing mm -hmm. without the parent getting very upset. Right, it's my job to discipline my child. No, it's, yes. it's called, you know, if and you that's... keep beating on me with the shovel, I'm <laughs> going to be upset, you know. <laughs> and that wasn't no. like it like that when we were young. No. Um, everybody was a parent to every kid, and, and you know. Yeah, so yeah. the ben benign neglect wasn't that much neglect because if the parent wasn't watching you, there were six other people who were. Right. <laughs> who were looking out. You know, I talk yeah. about walking from my house the quarter of a mile to the corner. Well, in that quarter of a mile, there, were, there was the Smith's house, there was the Williams' house, there was um, the Weir's house. Oh, and there was a farm up and back there. So the folks at the farmhouse, and then there was the Sunoco gas station mm -hmm. that was down at Five Corners, so mm -hmm. Ed Reardon. Yes, was Mr. It? Roden. Oh, Roden, yeah. Roden. So that, that, was, yeah. that was the group, so I wasn't... No, and, and I'm sure that uh, the people in those houses, they, they were looking out the window and, and looking out for you. Yeah. yeah. We walked to school, which you can't do now. Um, we walked to school a quarter mile around the, the corner to the school. We could go home for lunch, but we didn't, some did and some didn't. And that's when I was in first grade. Mm -hmm. It right. was safe to walk. Mm -hmm. My sister lives on the same street, mm -hmm. a couple of houses from where I grew up. When her son was in school, the school bus, it wasn't even a matter of having to cross the street to get on the school bus because the road had gotten that busy the neighbor across the street didn't necessarily ride on the same bus because the one bus went down and the other bus came up and the kids got on opposite buses. Uh-huh. Interesting. Because it wasn't safe to cross the street. <laughs> Isn't that something? Yeah. 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 Well, um, 
thank you so much for coming and, oh, and sharing your stories. Um, and um, well, I didn't tell you what I'm doing now. Oh, you didn't? No. Tell me no. what you're doing. What I'm doing now is I am continuing to teach nursing at Massasoit Community College in Brockton. I know. You're a professor. I'm a professor, yes. And yeah. I've been there for 20 years Yeah. yeah. or so. Yeah. And so all of that independence and self-sufficiency that was normal and natural to you and to me made us uh, do things that maybe we wouldn't have done we might have had uh, a, a standard that was not as high as we would have had if we hadn't if we had been sheltered we were permitted to grow yes we were right and one of the ways you grow is you learn from your errors and hopefully it's not a dangerous error they kept us from making major mm -hmm. errors but we were allowed to grow right you learn from a mistake here and there Right. Take it into the next if, step. Yeah, don't look at it as a defeat, but as an opportunity. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much, Charlotte. It's been great. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, it really has been a pleasure. And um, I've learned a lot about where you live, because I remember Avery talking about his farm. That was a farm. And there were many farms in Easton. Mm -hmm. And those farmlands now are dotted with um, houses. And um, in some ways, it's a shame that that we've oh. grown so big. We've grown from 6,000 to 24,000. And with that, uh, a lot of the uh, sense of community and family has been lost. We've had a lot of people who moved into the greater community who complain about what's going on. We moved away from this city or that city or that other area because we wanted this kind of life and, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they're complaining about the distance. Mm. They're complaining about the suburban life is not what they thought it was going to be. Mm -hmm. And they're unhappy with it. Mm. Well, I can say that um, we're both happy with our uh, lives. You're, you're living in Taunton now. I'm in Taunton now. Yeah, but I mean, the, uh, I still love Eastern and I think I've met wonderful people who have come here um, and uh, have contributed significantly to to the town, uh, especially in the area of preserving uh, open space mm -hmm. and and so forth. There's a sensitivity about the, our natural resources, a sensitivity to keeping them for future generations. Well, where I grew up, across the street was always considered too wet, too much of the Hockamock Swamp. Mm -hmm. This is now where Symphony Lane and those houses are. Oh, dear. Mm. OK, and if you look, those go way back into the, mm. what was swampland. Yeah, that's not a good thing. <laughs> no, no. It's, it's not. It's mm. when you look at um, the weather changes and major rainstorms, oh, yeah. there's no place for the water to go except right. into people's houses. Mm. Right. Well, thank you so much again. And we'll have to continue this at another time. Yes, we will. And, but I hope the audience at home has, has gotten a little slice of, uh, and a glimpse of what Easton was like uh, 50, 60 years ago, um, because it, it has changed. And children today uh, are, are not benefiting from all that independence and, that we had. Uh, so let's hope that, that the parents make up for that um, in their own way so that the children have the same um, uh, opportunity to grow and learn yes. and be okay. successful. Thank you, Charlotte, once, once again. And thank you for watching. I uh, hope you've enjoyed this program as much as we have. Be well.